So hello everyone and uh, welcome to our penultimate talk at Megacon. Um, we have Holly Wall who is going to be talking about first time mega game design. Um, is it worth it? Um, Holly uh, is a brand new game designer. She ran her first game uh, towards the end of last year called Fate of the World through North Mega Games. And yeah, she's going to be talking to you today about her experiences with that and was it worth it? Um, so yeah, over to you, Holly. Excellent. Hello. Uh, hello from the Alps. Uh, I unfortunately have not been able to attend Megacon because I spent all of yesterday traveling and now I'm trapped in a hellscape of cheese and wine and beautiful mountains. Um, but I hope you're all having an awesome time. Um, so I'm probably going to see if I can stop sharing my face and just share my screen. Um, and I've got a lovely state of the art little PowerPoint here. So, so here we go. Uh, so uh, I recently wrote a blog post for Mega Game Assembly called Fate of a First Time Mega Game Designer about my thoughts and experiences designing and running Fate of the World. So if you've read that, um, you'll know that my answer to this question, is it worth it? is yes. Um, so I'd actually like to expand on that today because while for me the answer is yes, it's yes with a great big asterisk. Um, so it was a hugely worthwhile experience and I do wanna be clear that I don't regret doing it at all, um, but it was also one of the most stressful experiences of my life. And I got married in May of 2021, mid pandemic, and that was significantly less stressful than designing and running Fate of the World. So in this talk, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the process, the pain points, and the things that I wish I'd known before I started in the hopes that I make things even just a little bit easier for at least one of you who is considering writing a game, because honestly, it really is such an amazing experience. <laughs> so points I'm gonna cover are getting started and staying on track, dealing with anxiety, finding a venue and selling tickets, and game day dread. So obviously all of these things could be very different for you. Um, maybe you're super confident and none of these even phase you. So if so, just stick around anyway, because I've got some cracking slides coming up and I think Generalissimo has already, already started. So <laughs> here we go. So getting started. Um, this was obviously my first sticking point. Um, much has been said about how impossible it is to define what a mega game is. Um, and it being so difficult to define just makes it a really daunting task to, to design one. What if you end up designing something that doesn't fit this non-existent definition? All I can think to do is describe the kind of common elements. So what I expect from a mega game is, a large number of people, a specific setting with set rules, objectives to aim for, and rules which allow for a certain degree of flexibility. So for me, I think the starting point has to be the setting. Everything else kind of hangs off that. Um, if you can come up with a setting that you would enjoy being part of for a day, then you know, you've more or less started. Danger is you can get sucked into creating an amazing setting and just lose track of everything else. This is my amazing setting. You can tell that I spent a long time on this presentation. Um, what can end up happening is that you, you get lost in the setting and your game ends up down here. So your setting needs to be the kind of space which can allow for multiple reasonably balanced groups to interact with each other all while working towards something. Um, and in my opinion, everybody should have the opportunity to feel like a main character in their particular story if they want to. Um, so it has to go, sorting the setting out has to go hand in hand with the roles that are gonna be played. So all of this is great. Um, I spent months thinking about the setting and characters for Fate of the World. Um, lots of thought, months, months of very deep thought. It was great. But at some point, you have to start writing things down. So to paraphrase 
Jeffrey Craner of the podcast Welcome to Night Vale and start with this. The best way to start writing a mega game is to start writing a mega game. Um, and the main thing to remember is that nothing you write has to make it into the finished game. So for me, the easiest way to do this was to open a Word document and just start typing. So for Fate of the World, I had a good sense of what the world looked like. And I just started by typing out the kinds of ideas I was having. So I would go kind of teams and some ideas and places and some ideas and so on and so on until I had fleshed out my setting and figured out what my roles would be and in a broad sense what they would be doing. So I don't think you really need to get bogged down with the how straight away, but, um, but I needed to have an idea of what the groups were and the types of players that I might want to have and what their purpose would be over the course of the game. So I knew I wanted my game to be role play heavy and collaborative. So my focus here was on the particular types of character I wanted to see and thinking about how they would interact. So I knew, for example, that I wanted a team of Morris dancers. Yeah. And a team of little old lady detectives. So I started out about thinking by thinking what about what are these particular teams likely to be involved in? Do they have any secrets? What would they be looking to achieve um, over the course of the game? <laughs> um, so yeah, once you kind of figure that out, as you can see, it's just a case of figuring out how those interactions can be reflected in mini games, and then you're done. But of course, it's not as easy as that. It's not going to happen immediately. Um, I have no source for this, but I feel pretty confident that there is not a mega game in the world which has transitioned smoothly through the design process without being changed along the way, probably drastically. Um, so I came up with a million dead ends along the way. And having just spent weeks on a particular path, it was really disheartening to realize that I was going to need to backtrack through weeks and weeks of work, um, or worse, there were the non-dead ends, the kind of winding paths that would just take you further and further away from your goal, but so interesting that you just keep pursuing them. The paths that might lead somewhere amazing, but which take you so far away from your premise that you eventually just have to make the decision that they aren't worth it, at least at this point. So as an example, the baking competition. I spent a huge amount of time working on a complicated baking competition for Fate of the World, coming up with specific ingredients and flavors, which would be represented by plasticine and would be combined into recipes, which were looked up on a spreadsheet to determine how tasty they would be, or if they would be an inedible mess. Players were going to have allergies and preferences and they would need to take um, into account the potential for sabotage and bribery and poisoning. And I spent so long trying to perfect that game before I realized that I was creating an entire game just by itself, which maybe someday I'll run. Um, and it was really hard to go back to the start and strip it down to what was in the end, really just an excuse for the players to play with plasticine. And oddly enough, according to the feedback forms that actually seem to be the most popular part of the day. So how do you actually stay on track? So my little drawings, uh, if you're the kind of person that can juggle jobs and friends and hobbies and family and keeping your home clean and tidy and still have time to read a book or keep up to date with the latest series on HBO, then you're laughing. But for those of us whose days are regularly um, begun and ended before we've even woken up, this can be an issue. And I am not the expert on this. So, um, you may be able to tell I actually wrote the bulk of this talk last night, seriously. Um, but what I can tell you is what I wish I had done when designing the game and what I know would have made the process much smoother. So the advice that I really wish I could follow is to schedule in time for your mega games instead of trying to fit it around everything else. So give yourself a set time to focus on your game, even if it's just an hour a week to begin with. So you can and probably should increase it over time and just switch off from everything else and just write 
even if it's nonsense that you won't use just write anything because that's the best way to get a spark of an idea that will lead you to something great and when I schedule in time I'm I'm serious I actually what I wish I had done was set up a recurring appointment on my phone that would force me to do something related to the game I think if you leave it and try and fit it in where you have a spare minute you will find that you never have a spare minute so here is a list of some things that I did instead of working on my game. This is not an exhaustive list. I organized the clothes in my wardrobe by color. I spent hours searching for a golden stag in Animal Crossing, which I still don't have. I decided I need to learn the bass guitar. I rewatched all of Parks and Rec. I tried to train my rats to fetch. And do you wanna take a guess whether I enjoyed any of those things? Um, <laughs> when you know that you have something ho hovering over your shoulder, like a giant screeching bat, it's really hard to concentrate. And the worst part is, I really enjoyed working on the game and seeing it come together. It's just that it was all tied up with the constant anxiety. So, dealing with anxiety. Apparently it's normal. While I was writing fate of the world. I would occasionally speak to people who had designed games themselves and generally the conversation would go something like this. Uh, seasoned designer, so how's the writing going? Me? I am oscillating between being certain this is the greatest game that has ever been created and being certain that it is a disaster that is going to crash and burn and fail. Season designer, yeah, that sounds about normal. And no matter how many times I had these conversations, I always left them in the same state of mind. This time oscillating between feeling comforted that every designer goes through this and being 100% absolutely certain that this seasoned designer just did not understand my exceptional potential for disastrous failure. But the thing is, I just want to say the same to you. I almost gave up so many times and I'm glad I didn't, but it was hard. So one piece of advice that I have to give you about this is just to be kind to yourself. So there might be days where you just can't face writing anything. Give yourself permission to take that day off and not feel guilty about it. Or better yet, if you've decided you're not gonna be writing, instead, allow yourself to enjoy researching your game. You've picked the setting you have because you find it interesting, so spend a bit of time immersing yourself in media on your theme, whether it's watching a documentary about magicians or playing Uncharted, or as in my case, reading a lot of Miss Marple. You never know what's gonna give you a little bit of spark of inspiration. The worst thing you can do is wallow in the swamp of doubt. So what kept me going through that was thinking, what is the absolute worst thing that could happen? And I know that's a dangerous game to play, but hear me out. Really, the worst thing that could happen is that people just don't enjoy the game. And that would suck, but that would be it. The day would still pass and you would get plenty of feedback about how to improve, and then it would be over. And weirdly, that's what kept me from completely losing track of what I was doing. If the worst thing that can happen is that people don't enjoy themselves, then you just have to keep bringing your focus back to how to stop that from happening. And the good thing is you're part of an immensely supportive community who want to see games succeed. So this is the advice I got in the final days before the game, and it's so true. Mega gamers come to a game determined to have fun, and they generally will find a way to do that. Give them a handful of elements to play with, and they'll take them beyond where you thought they could go, probably incorporating the box that they came into. So in a way, the players are really the most important resources in the game and don't be afraid to use them. Which brings me on to uh, the practicalities of how to get people to your game. Finding a venue and selling tickets. So obviously the problem that I had, or the, the biggest problem I had was that my game was taking place in 2021 with all the 
uncertainty that we're all well aware of. Lots of venues are still closed. The ones which were open were quickly getting booked up. But even if we imagine that you're not gonna be booking this venue mid pandemic, there are a whole host of things you need to be aware of. So I've got a few key pieces of, info, uh, of advice when it comes to venues. So the first one is sort your venue out as early as possible. So when I finally found my venue, it was much smaller than I'd wanted. And that caused me to have significantly, uh, have to significantly cut down the numbers for the game. I had a choice of either continuing on what seemed like a completely fruitless quest for the perfect venue or just use the space I had and fit the game into it. Consider spaces you might not have thought of. So I started off by Googling venues in Glasgow, which mostly brought back wedding venues. And while some of these would have been lovely, they also would have been super expensive and were all booked up by couples who had had to postpone their weddings. And I sent out so many emails to so many places and I was really, really starting to panic. And then finally, a couple of people suggested that I try the conference spaces and hotels. And what do you know, that opened up so many spaces that I just hadn't even considered. Not only that, but they were spaces with wheelchair accessibility and bars and possibly parking and somewhere for players to stay. And I really wish I'd started looking into hotels earlier because as it was, I was extremely desperate and went for the first one I went to see and very likely paid more than I had to. Uh, think about how you're going to explain what the space is for. So not everyone knows what a mega game is. I mean, as discussed earlier, even we don't really know what a mega game is. Um, the way I ended up explaining it was by saying it was similar to one of those large team building games that businesses put their employees through, but with people who were actually choosing to come. Um, more recently, I've had someone describing it to a venue as a board gaming club, which I think is what I'm going to go with next time. But I think the key is to get across that the people coming to this event will not be people the venue needs to worry about. That we may get heated in game, but we're generally a well behaved bunch. Um, go and see the space. So this might seem obvious, but I almost booked a different room because the description online said it could hold 30 people in a banqueting style or 48 as a standing reception. And the pictures made it look huge. And when I went to see it, it was immediately clear that there was no way a mega game could ever happen in that room. So to give you some numbers, that room was six and a half by six and a half meters, which, you know, in my head sounds massive. Um, and according to the website, it could hold, wait, 30 people. The room I ended up with was about 15 meters by six. And according to the website could hold 70 people banquet style. On the day we had less than 30 people in the room. And honestly, I don't think we could have had any more. So remember that you're likely to want everyone to have a space, not only at their team table, but at whatever mini game or games they might be involved in and space to move around freely between them. So however many people the venue says the space holds, you probably want to at least divide that by two. Yet the measurements. So I'd say it's, it's a good idea if you can to get the measurements of your space and actually draw out the room. This is what I did and then draw out some little desks and chairs and just have a little go at rearranging. It also means that if you are lucky enough to have found a venue who will set this up for you, that you can send them a plan and they can get it ready for you, even if ultimately on the day you end up rearranging it. So once you've got the venue sorted, you can go ahead and start selling tickets. And this, I think this was the, the most awkward and uncomfortable part for me, because how, how do you ask people to spend money on a game that you may not have even finished writing yet and that every other day you are convinced is not going to happen? How much do you charge for that? How do you figure out what's reasonable, particularly when things are just opening up after a pandemic, which has just had a, a huge financial impact on a lot of people? So after a lot of thought, I decided on pay what you can tickets on Eventbrite. So here are my pros and cons of pay what you can tickets. Pro, you can stop stressing out about how to price your game. Con, are you just passing that stress onto the players who now have to figure out for themselves how much is a reasonable amount to pay? Pro, 
people might pay more than you would expect. Con, people might take advantage and decide to pay 50p, even though they could easily afford a ticket. So to try and take advantage, uh, to try and take the potential stress off the players at point number one, what I ended up doing was including a suggested price of 30 pounds, but tried to make it as clear as possible in the description that people should honestly just pay what they could afford. And for the second, there was really no way to know what was gonna happen until I put the tickets up for sale. But as it was, I think everyone took it as it, as it was intended and paid what they were able to. And overall, the tickets bought averaged out at around 30 pounds each anyway. Some people paid a bit more, some people paid a bit less. Um, and it just made the whole thing so much easier for me. So obviously I'm not saying that everybody should start making their tickets pay what you can, but just that it worked for me. Um, and I think kind of took away a little bit of my stress for the day. Here are a couple of things that I didn't do, but really wish I had. First of all, have a separate set of tickets on sale for free for people who want to control. So as it was, I just assumed in my head that a bunch of True North people would be happy to control and thank the actual stars they were because I didn't get around to actually asking them until way down the line. And that is not a reasonable way to organize control for your game. And two, set up a reserve list in case people drop out. Having a reserve list would have been so useful. I knew it was possible and in fact likely that people would drop out so I don't know why I didn't do this and as it was I was lucky that only two people couldn't make it on the day but having a reserve list would have meant that those places might actually have been filled. Um, the other thing to bear in mind about selling tickets is that it makes it all real so as soon as people start buying tickets you know they might be organizing travel and accommodation, and it all becomes that much harder to cancel in a panic. The day you put your tickets on sale is the day that the ticking clock really begins, and you begin to feel the overwhelming game day dread. I think that's people coming home. <laughs> so I spoke about anxiety before, that was nothing. The day of fate of the world was the most nerve wracking day of my life. Suddenly this thing, which had for the most part existed in my head was going to be out there. People were gonna play it. And worse, I was gonna have, have to actually speak to them loudly so they could hear. My husband had to remind me to breathe more than once that morning. I don't think I'm alone here. There's something terrifying about setting your creation up and just letting it go. It's like having spent a year making a model boat and not knowing how it's gonna hold up, knowing that bits of it held together with old tape and other bits have already fallen off, but you need to put it on the river and just watch it go. And it doesn't help that you've likely had very little sleep and had to get up early to get your space set up before, the, before everyone arrives to the event. This is where you need a good control team. They all help you get set up and give you an honest opinion about any last minute tweaks I think without my control team coming in and behaving as though disaster wasn't actually around the corner, I might just have barricaded myself in there and pretended nobody was home. It's the final hour when people were starting to congregate outside and I was putting together an extremely last minute PowerPoint to show the turns in the actual event was just, just the worst. It's like the countdown clock, but at the doodly do, the floor is gonna open up under you but you'll never guess what happened. The players came in and control went to their places. And I think I spoke to everyone and told them what to expect. And the game started and I floated about and I answered questions when people asked me and I heard people's schemes and their stories start to develop. And at some point, I couldn't tell you when, I looked over my shoulder and the panic just wasn't there anymore. Because once the game starts, you give up the control, the game isn't yours anymore, it belongs to the players and they're twisting it and shaping it and turning it into what they need to have a good day. And all you need to do is just be there with your extensive knowledge of the world they're playing in and to give the story a little nudge when you need to. 
so maybe the anxiety is needed maybe the the game day dread is needed because that drives you to the point where you can just let go so i knew it had all been worth it in the pub afterwards when one of the players matthew pulled a card out of his pocket that he had just had to keep and it was a card which i had made with um no idea how significant it would turn out turn out to be an unassuming frog who just wanted to be friends and over the course of the game he had been christened green bobby and he had had as many adventures as any of the players, wandering the wilderness in a tiny mech suit and being re-rescued from the New Gorbals Memorial Duck Pond and being the ring bearer at the wedding of Jackie Weaver and Agatha Marbles. And the only part of that that had come from me was making a card to represent a friendly frog. So is it worth it? It's hard and there's lots to consider, but one thing to remember is the element that you just can't control, which is the players. So <laughs> I'm gonna end by just being a little bit mushy. It's the players, it's you lot that make it worth it. Every epic mega game story is driven by the players taking something and running with it. So I think my final point is if you're thinking about giving mega game writing a go, just remember there's only so much you can control and it's the players who are gonna do all the legwork of making the day worth it. And most of the time they will. So there you go. That felt almost like a therapy session. Uh, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, I don't know about, um, everyone else who's who's run a game in here who's in the audience but so much of that resonated so strongly with me the and yeah the moment in the game where you realize that it's it's not just a thing that's that you've put together this is an actual mega game like all those other mega games you've played in yeah that <laughs> that's definitely the case um just going to have a look through the chat now if, if anyone does have any questions then please just post those in um, I can see that uh, people saying that the PowerPoint looks amazing. I absolutely <laughs> agree. It's, it, is, is it a PowerPoint or is it, is it that is, your doodles? It's a, it's a PowerPoint, but I, I brought my tablet with me because last night I was like, oh my goodness, I need actual slides. So. <laughs> That's so, so good. So creative. I can't figure out how to stop sharing my, my screen. Just FYI. I can't actually do that right now. Um, I, <laughs> there we go. Hey. Cool. Um, now my chat has gone away. Uh, let me just find that again. Uh, two seconds. There we go. Uh, so yeah, lots of people agreeing with things that you've said in the chat. Um, Kevin said that speaking in front of other people is the worst. Um, one of the <laughs> early games that he ran, everyone was in and we were ready to start. I hold the microphone and just stood there for two minutes before he could talk. I do think my public speaking has got a lot better since I've been mega gaming. Yeah, I, I have no idea what I actually said on the day of the game, honestly. Not a clue. I had to be reminded to tell people where the toilets were and the fire escape and yeah. Yeah, I, I always have a little uh, bit of paper, little list of things to remember to say. So even if everything else I say is complete rubbish, at least I've said all those things. <laughs> um, let me see. So Ed Silverstone has said, my big reflection off the back of this is to wonder how the community can provide additional support for new designers. For my first game, Dave Boundy did the big welcome slash intro for me, which was no doubt a small thing for him, but put a big weight off my shoulders. Have you got any thoughts, Holly, about how the community as a whole can support new designers better? Yeah, so I think um, I was actually really lucky in that um, I had a lot of support from True North. And particularly, I think I said this one in my my article on Mega Game Assembly, Seamus was my mega game mentor. And if I'd said, you know, Seamus, I really need you to do the talking at the beginning of this, I'm certain that he would have he would have been prepared to do that. But um, so I think I think being involved in a group like that, a network like that, is a really, really helpful way. And also just um I, I know that I think it was Tim had a, a session about this that unfortunately I couldn't kind of go to about being being nice to your designers kind of thing. Um, and I, I think that all of the, the player support was there for me on the day. And there was more support available that I just didn't take because I just 
freaked myself out too much and couldn't let go of control. So I think that's what I kind of wanted to, to get across in this was that actually there is a lot of support out there if you just, <laughs> you're just willing to actually take it, I would say. Yeah, I definitely do agree. And I do think that I, I spent a lot of my first few, honestly, all my designs so far, not taking advantage as much of the, the amount of support and, and generosity there is in the community to, to really help you improve it. And that's something that I'm going to try and do a bit more in the future. Um, so uh, John Keyworth said, had a conversation at one point, can't remember who, but the upshot was designing a game, game controlling a game and playing host doesn't have to be the same person. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I think after this, I would be more prepared to be involved as a kind of, as just a part, as just a kind of a cog in the wheel of designing a mega game. And I think that would be really nice. And in fact, you know, I'm intending to do that kind of further on in the year. In fact, I think with John, <laughs> um, but I think the very first time, again, this is just a control thing. I think the very first time I just had to feel like I'd, I'd done all of the stuff. And I don't think that's necessarily a particularly healthy way to, to do it. Um, so I think, I think that mega games are so collaborative that I think they lend themselves quite well to that kind of a, um, that kind of a setup. So yeah, having, having a few people working together to design a game or designing a game and then handing it off to somebody else to actually run is probably, quite a, a sensible way to do things. Please piling through the door right now, everyone's <laughs> just come back. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, no, people have different skills in different areas, um, don't they? Um, yeah, Ed's chimed in, stuff like finding the menu, managing bookings, etc., can totally be done by someone else. And I think that's one of the benefits of being in a community mm -hmm. like True North. Yeah, well, the venue thing, like that was the biggest headache for me was because see until you've done it you just don't know where to start like people were saying church halls and things but I was just like how do you how do you I still don't know how you book a church hall I don't know do you just go up do you just like rock up at the door and knock the door and say can we have your hall no idea still no idea um, I, I chose a very modern church hall that had a website so that was how I right, found my, <laughs> my church hall but <laughs> The only church hall that I, I did have the potential to book that had a website was also uh, a hall that had had some questionable speakers in the past and I didn't particularly want to give my money over to them so I did cross them off the list specifically but other than that no no idea <laughs> yeah yeah venues are venues are a whole big other question I reckon we at some point maybe we should yeah. do a, a whole session about venue venue finding but I found your your comments on it during the presentation really useful <laughs> Um, so Tony has asked a question. My biggest fear is not selling enough tickets. How did you cope with that, and how did you advertise? So um, I had exactly the same the same issue. Um, I mean, I was lucky in in that because of the size of the venue, I ended up only really being able to fit in twenty players. Um, so I was I was lucky that I kind of put the tickets on sale, and then you know twenty tickets like got got sold relatively quickly. Um, what I did to kind of promote it was I had some kind of artwork um, that I'd put together when I was procrastinating that I started to put up as little kind of teasers. So in the kind of run up to the tickets going on sale, I would put up a little kind of teaser every so often. And I think I had some advice from various people about the best time of day. I think it was around about half past three is the best time of day to put it up because people are starting to flag and then they go onto Facebook and they they kind of see a thing and it sticks in their minds. Um, and just like, again, true North, you kind of like I put it up and then people share it and you put it on the Discord and you put it in the different places. And I obviously pestered people that I know. So I, I did try to get people that I know involved in coming to the game, but nobody nobody was up for, <laughs> nobody was up for it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure, especially given the, the time of, um, you know, the, the situation with the world, whether I would have been able to sell more than 20 tickets to that. And I, I did speak about the reserve list there, but again, no idea whether that actually would have been of any use at all. Yeah, 
Yeah, so selling tickets to games is, is a big challenge. And I think communities like True North definitely help with things like that, where you've got the existing player base. I'm really sad that I couldn't make it up for <laughs> Face of the World. Um, that, so that's my one of my other questions. What's the future for you as a designer? Are you planning on doing Fate anywhere else? Do you have any other designs floating around? <laughs> um, so I was on an absolute high after Fate of the World and I would have run it again immediately. Um, with, with a lot of like, one of the good things about finishing that was getting the feedback back, speaking to people in the pub, because there were things that didn't work and I'm sure most games have stuff that doesn't work. So I, I immediately, I just wanted to get in and fix all the issues and run it again. Um, so, but then, you know, after a couple of weeks, I was like, I can't do that again for a while. Like (laughs) once the, once the high comes down, I was like, right, I need a little break. So, um, I am going to be involved in putting um like collaborating on a a game this year um and I would like to run Fate of the World again like a fixed version of Fate of the World maybe for more players maybe a sequel maybe um another splice uh (laughs) yeah okay that that was that was that was the name that was floating around in my head for the sequel but I, I can improve on that um so yeah I think I don't think this is the end of my it hasn't put me off the pain has not put me off ever doing it again I think I've just learned a few lessons about what to do differently next time yeah I think that is the most important thing is that no one expects your no one except yourself expects your first game design to be perfect and you do learn an awful lot from the first time that you will put into every future game that you that you produce I'm just going to see if we've got any more questions in here so john said mega game networks can also help with pre-game imposter syndrome if they're putting it on their reputation is on the line so they you should get honest feedback from them and they'll probably say your game is good you just have to be willing to believe them that's the that's the trick it's like it doesn't matter how many people say it's like the thing it doesn't matter how many people say this is totally normal the stress is totally normal like it's going to be fine you 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 just 100 percent don't believe them until it actually yeah. happens Oh dear. And Paddy's saying there's no improvement needed for that subtitle for the second round. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, I think that's um, all the questions we've got at the moment. Um, have you got any final thoughts for anyone who is maybe watching this and considering their first design? Um, just, just, just do it. Just like, just start it right now. Like get off this, get a piece of paper and make a, make a mind map or do a drawing or do something because the more you start putting it down, the more you get it down into a, a, a thing that you can look at and play with, the closer you get to the actual game. That's my final thought. That and, Fantastic. And just, um, and just Green Bobby will always have a place in my heart. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I very much echo both sentiments. <laughs> cool well thanks so much holly so everyone else um we have one more uh session tonight at megacon um so it's well we have a few more activities taking place so it's 8 4 p.m so in about half an hour nine megan assault is going to be starting um and then uh at 8 p.m the councils of alporia is going to be starting uh you do need to have tickets for both of those they are both sold out we have had some dropouts in our other games that have taken place this weekend so if you're on the wait list for either of those games then maybe keep an eye on the discord server just in case um and then our final um podcast of the con is taking place tonight at 9 p.m and that is memories of the con where we're going to be having uh harrison tatum wyatt fresh from his holiday uh it's a very very holiday season at the moment (laughs) apparently um he's going to be hosting uh the mega game assembly talking about memories of the con so we're going to be reminiscing about all the fantastic stuff that's happened over the weekend it's going to be a it's it, those podcasts are always a laugh so come along and join us for that um but yeah thank you once again so much holly thank you all <laughs> thanks bye see you later